So this is night one of the Winter Star Party. Well, it's actually night two, but night one uh, was a complete and utter washout. We had this awful storm yesterday, lots of driving rain and wind, and we've still got the wind today. But luckily, we've actually got a clear sky. So I've set up here. I've set up here. So uh, we're going to do some live stacking with Keith, who is set up here and has a mailing cap, but he's not used the new sort of sharp cap, but live stacking software. So I'm going to observe with him tonight. We're sort of set up here behind a bush here. So the wind is actually coming from behind me. Uh, so this is why we're sheltered here, or vaguely sheltered here. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll have a night of observing distant galaxies and stuff. So just behind this is the Caribbean. So we're looking due or south is actually about here. So we're looking nearly due south from here. So we'll be able to see lots of exotic southern objects that we simply just can't see from the UK. It's a good shakedown night of all the kit. Uh, and we'll bring you more pictures from the night sky. So first thing I've noticed here is how low um, the, the sort of plow and, and Polaris, the pole star are, they're really low. Uh, over the sort of northern horizon it's quite hard you know for me you know normally the plow's really high but here it's hugging the horizon and it doesn't rise properly until the small hours in the morning and conversely if I look south I can see Orion but I can also see constellations under Orion that I just can't see from back home so we've got you know uh, um, Canis Major and Eridanus and all those sort of things that yeah, they, they don't, they're sort of hugging the horizon or they're even below the horizon. So there's constellations I've had to learn <laughs> every time I come here. I have to turn to new pages in my star ads because I've never used them before. So what I thought we'd do then is find um, two interesting galaxies uh, and then I'm going to do my favourite highlights of the winter sky. Right, I've done my three star alignment. Well, the satellite just went across the field of view. So, to focus, I just put my Batonoff mask over the objective lens. So we've got the telescope finally set up and I think the wind has finally dropped a little bit. It's feeling a lot calmer now. So we've focused, uh, I've done the three star line and I've told the telescope to go down to Eridanus, which is the constellation below Orion. And I, it's not really a constellation. I know I simply can't see it uh, from back home in England. So we're looking at, uh, and I've got to remind myself. So we're looking at NGC 1532, which is this beautiful, uh, down here, beautiful edge on sort of spiral galaxy. Um, and it's got a little, little galaxy alongside it, so you can actually see it's deformed, it's got deformed spiral arms. So I was so excited because here I am, you know, using the telescope I carried in my hand luggage uh, to explore, you know, deformed galaxies. Absolutely blown away by all this. This is so cool. So we've been live stacking now for, what's that, about sort of several minutes now. Um, but yeah, you can start to, start to pick out the spiral arms, some of the structure within the spiral arms as well. What I've done is I've just turned the, the sort of camera, just turned the laptop away. What I've actually been doing is sketching the the monitor screen, sketching what I can see on the IP. So while I wait for that image to be a run, I'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs. I actually quite enjoy that sort of journaling, that sort of sketching side and using the camera as an eyepiece is simply wonderful. So what I've done in my logbook is actually sketched out uh, how the galaxy appears. So I'll show you that uh, in the morning when the, when the sun comes up and you can actually <laughs> see what I'm doing. But yeah, I can see on the monitor the sort of delicate lacy spiral arms um, and the little satellite galaxy as well. So 
yeah that's pretty amazing isn't it right so the next galaxy i'm going to go to is again it's another object i, I haven't seen before for me canis major is is really low uh, down below um down below orion which is which is pretty low for me back in england it's hidden below the trees canis major so I've got NGC 2207, which is this double galaxy. It's actually two interacting galaxies. It's two galaxies physically orbiting each other. And because they're so close to each other, they've actually sort of tidally, uh, what's with interlocked, and they've deformed, and they pulled their spiral arms away from each other. So I can't believe, again, this is a telescope I've carried in my hand luggage, and I can watch interacting uh, spiral galaxies out in the depths of intergalactic space. I've been doing astronomy for, you know, decades now uh, and I've never seen these galaxies never seen them here before um, so fantastic and of course being the, using the power of the camera and uh, using the power of live stacking means I can actually resolve these spiral arms or star clouds in the spiral arms uh, by using the live stacking so really excited you know to be overlooking the Caribbean the Caribbean is just over there and yet I can see through the telescope these these wonderful features uh, in galaxies that you know I just can't see from back home. So now I've done the sort of warm up out objects, you know, some of these new exciting objects. What I thought I'd do then is I'm just going to spend a few minutes on my favourite uh, deep sky objects in the winter sky. Now I can see some of these from back home in England, uh, but what I will do is just show you what they look like from a, you know, a good dark sky. So there's no prizes for guessing what my first object is. This is the Orion Nebula, and I think when we're hunting for these sort of faint fuzzy sort of galaxies, these sort of faint deep sky objects, and there will always be a bit of a hard challenge to sort of identify and find. Then you look at the Orion Nebula, and you've got this beautiful nebula, still this beautiful tendrils of dust, clouds, and star-forming regions. It is such a wonderful sight. And I think it's the deep sky object with the sort of highest surface brightness. So, you know, it actually looks really good to the eye when you look at it through a telescope as well. So not only does it look stunning uh, when we're live stacking with the camera, but it also looks really, really good uh, when you look through some of the big telescopes near here. Now, what I've had to do is actually reduce the exposures. I normally do sort of a five second or a 10 second exposure. These are two second exposures, one after the other, two seconds, stacking them one on top of the other. And that's simply because any more than that, and I burn out the core, you've got this very bright core of gas and dust. Plus, you've got some of the stars, some of the stars that are forming in there as well. And so I've had to reduce that exposure time just to stop the stars from burning out. That is absolutely stunning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch it uh, one way and that, so I've got the core just right so I don't burn it out. I think I'm going to really stretch it, bring out some of all the fainter outer dust layers. Uh, and then I'll combine the two. I'll use the sort of layers in Photoshop and put one on top of the other and be able to get the, the core, the details in the core and sort of fainter outer regions as well. That is beautiful. Almost looks like sort of cotton wool, sort of cotton wool texture right in the middle. And that's a nursery of stars, that stars being formed. They're being born in that cloud of dust. They're coalescing together. They're forming their little dust cloud, uh, turning into stars. Uh, stars are producing energy and that is illuminating. That's causing that energy is causing the dust cloud to, to fluoresce. And that's what we can see. That is so cool. Beautiful. Stars are being born in the Orion Nebula. Right, so now we're going to go to another deep sky object. See there. There we have it. One nags noggin. And very bright star in the middle. One flame and one horsey. So hopefully you can see this now. Probably not. Let's see if I can reduce the exposure a little bit. This is the flame nebula down at the bottom. And if I go up here, you see that little notch that's in the nebulosity, that's actually the horsehead nebula. 
So when you're observing, the horse head is one of the little challenging objects to try and find it. So the horse head is a really dark sort of dust cloud. It's a cloud of dust uh, and it's obscuring this very low surface brightness nebulosity, this little band of dust. It's all part of the same uh, dust complex that the Orion Nebula is, it's just a bit further away. Uh, so we've got this huge cloud of gas and dust and in front of it is a, is a bit that's not shining there. We've got this dark silhouette and it's really hard to see. It's a real visual challenging. And of course, but by using the camera, by using live stacking, there we have it. Now the real challenging thing is there's a really bright star, one of the belt stars in the Orion called Alnatak, Attack, uh, and that's in the field of view, so that's kind of dazzling everything out. So that's a challenge when you look at it with a, with a telescope, with the eyepiece, that really bright star right in the middle of it. But yeah, the telescope, I've carried in my hand luggage and I can see details inside the Horsehead Nebula, you know, by using the camera, by using the power of live stacking. This object here is actually one of the most scientifically interesting objects we're going to look at tonight. This is Hubble's Variable Nebula and it's so cool that it was discovered by... Well, I don't think it was discovered by Hubble, but he certainly did a lot of the science behind it. Uh, and what it is, is a variable star. It's called a T Tauri star. It's a star that's still forming out of a cloud of gas... Uh, das, oh, God, I can't even speak. I'm getting so tired. It's formed from a cloud of gas and dust. Uh, and as it's still forming, its sort of brightness fluctuates as, as material falls onto it. Uh, and therefore, uh, because it's still in the dust cloud, it, the, the dust cloud varies in brightness as well. That energy from the star that's lighting up the dust cloud uh, causes that to fluctuate. So it actually changes in brightness. The nebulosity changes in brightness uh, as the star varies in brightness as well. So. Now, when I first saw this object in a telescope through the eyepiece, I was exploring the sort of winter skies, and I actually thought I discovered the comet. You know, it's got this sort of little bright nucleus with a little fan shape coming off it, which is what you can see here. <laughs> I actually thought, oh my god, I found a comet. And of course, I referred to my star charts, and I've done nothing of the sort. Right, let you have a look at this as well. On the screen is what's called the Rosette Nebula. So you've got, again, it's another cloud of dust. It's coalescing together. It's formed, a, formed stars. It's formed a cluster of stars. You've got that sort of line of two by two by two stars, a little sort of three by two matrix. Oh, a satellite's calling across the field of view. So I've got a satellite as well. So bloody, um, bloody Elon Musk and all his bloody satellites. Um, so yeah, so that's what I actually see in, in, in when you look at it through a telescope. Uh, when I'm star hopping to it, that's the that's what I look out for. And you've got the very faint nebulosity around it. And it's a real testament actually to the skies here because we're looking south, we're looking out over to the sea. The light pollution to the south is pretty low. There's just about seeing on a hazy night uh, the light from Havana. That's 90 kilometres or something distant. Uh, but this this is this huge, huge object, very low surface brightness. It's quite a challenge to see visually. And yet here we are, you know, using the power of the camera, being able to resolve this stuff. And this object's big, it fills the field of view. Uh, and you can see the star cluster uh, in the centre of it uh, with, the, with the cloud of dust, the ring of cloud and ring of dust around it. Now, what's interesting in this is it's got what they call Bock globules. Uh, and that was named after by the astronomer Bart Bock, a Dutch astronomer. And he had these little clouds of, you notice these clouds of dark dust. And again, they're, they're bits that haven't formed stars yet. So therefore they look dark, they're not shiny. But inside those are the dense cores that are going to form stars. So they're actually stars in the making. These little dust lanes, these dark patches in the middle of it. That's beautiful.
Right, so we've had a look at galaxies, we've had a look at nebulas, we've had a look at stuff, but what I'm going to do now is show you a star cluster. Now, when I observe them with my binoculars, this is one of my favourites of the star cluster. So we're just going to go to M46, Messier 46, and you've got this beautiful star cluster, and we've also got a bonus object as well. So let's just do the go to. That's the raw sub there. And I love this. It's like magic, isn't it? You bring that slider to there. I find just to the left there. Bring that one to the right. And oh my good lord, there's a whole load of detail. So when stars are formed, they coalesce together in this sort of dust cloud. Uh, and then you get what's left behind is called an open cluster. You've got this cluster of stars that are physically, gravitationally bound together. So Messier 46 is one of the best star clusters you can see in the night sky. You've got this beautiful, uh, rich cloud of stars, and they're all roughly the same brightness, same age, and same brightness. And what's interesting is in front of it is a little donut. Now that's called a planetary nebula. That's a, a, and that's because when they were discovered, uh, when people were surveying the, the skies with telescopes in the 1700s 1800s they look like small planets you know little round discs they're nothing to do with planets they're actually stars stars that come to the edge of their life and they sort of puffed out their sort of outer atmosphere uh, so that's a dying star so we've actually got a very young group of stars stars born in the star cluster uh, born out the same cloud of nebulosity so they're all relatively young uh, yet at the same time We've got a dying star, a star that's puffed out all its outer atmospheres and it's run out of nuclear fuel, it's the fu nuclear fusion slows down. So the research is that this is a foreground object, it's not actually part of the star cluster, it just happens to line uh, in the line of sight. But that's pretty cool, it's quite, it's one of those objects you can see, you know, with any sort of reasonable size telescope, but you know, just to be sitting here with my cup of tea <laughs> looking at a star cluster and the planetary nebula and they happen to line up uh, across the depths of deep space. That is pretty cool. So I hope you enjoyed that video. It was great fun being at the Winter Star Party, seeing all those wonderful telescopes and being able to observe under those warm tropical skies. So that was the best of the winter objects. I've also got to do the same for the sort of exotic southern objects. So we've got Omega Centauri and Eta Carina. I also want to do the best of the spring galaxies as well, some of the exotic spring galaxies I saw. And my thanks to Rashpal, the Patreon supporter, the one Patreon supporter I seem to have attracted. If you do want to help support Ref refreshing views then please do take a look at the Patreon account that means we've got more resources to make these videos and that means I can actually take some time off work and then put these videos together. So thank you again Rashpal, thank you for your support so I look forward to bringing you more videos as we explore the night sky but this time from the warm skies of the Caribbean so we've got the exotic southern objects to do and we've got the springtime galaxies we've also been observing the full moon as well being able to see the mountains the peaks of eternal sunlight down near the South Pole so I've got loads of videos to process so if you want to those don't forget to like and subscribe and i will see you in the next video